2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the first federally funded program to assist people with disabilities who had not acquired their disabilities as a result of serving in the military. The Rehabilitation Services Administration provides leadership and resources to assist states in providing vocational rehabilitation and other services to individuals with disabilities to maximize their employment, independence, and integration into the community and the competitive labor market. RSA celebrates 100 years of vocational rehabilitation with this historical perspective, the State Vocational Rehabilitation Services Program, the first 100 years. Welcome to this historical overview of the VR program as the program nears its 100th birthday on June 2nd, 2020. This webinar is intended to be a broad overview of the development of the VR program, but it is not a complete, comprehensive, or highly detailed account. What we hope to do is to show some of the broad themes from the past 100 years that might be relevant to the next 100 years. The most important of these trends is expressed by this quote from an unpublished draft history completed by RFA staff in the early 2000s. Over this period of time, the program has reinvented itself numerous times to meet the ever-changing employment needs and challenges faced by individuals with disabilities and the demands of public policy. While the basic purpose of the program has remained constant since its inception, the program has adapted itself to make use of new and more effective modalities to empower individuals with disabilities, particularly those with significant disabilities, to achieve the high-quality employment outcomes to which they aspire and choose. The main point to watch for in that slide is how VR has changed as a result of changes in the environment and the public policy responses to those changes in the environment, and secondly, as a result of new ways to better assist individuals with disabilities to achieve their employment outcomes. Some other threads or concepts to watch for include the move over time from simple programs and simple environments to more complex environmental demands and more complex program requirements. The changes in VR based on external public policy demands have often been related to periods of time where we tried to deal with issues of poverty or war. Another thought to look for is that VR has always been part of a system of working with other federal agencies, but those working arrangements have been loosely coupled or more tightly coupled depending on periods of time and perhaps the impact of other legislation on creating relationships with the VR program. Most especially, we have had ongoing relationships of one sort or another with the Department of Labor, with the Social Security Administration, and with various parts of the Health and Human Services Agency. The general organization of most of the slides that follow include a discussion of what's going on in the external environment, what some of the public policy issues are that occur as a response to that. In those slides, you will see the parentheses ES, which really means environmental scan. So we can talk a little bit about the environmental context as that changes, and then the slides that follow will talk about the changes to the VR program as a result of those amendments and legislation. In 1920, when the smith fess Act was passed, there was already an interesting set of environmental activities or pressures going on. There had been discussion for several years about VR programs, both for the military as a result of World War I injuries, but also because of industrial injuries, which actually significantly outnumbered injuries from World War I. In 1908, the federal government launched the first workers' compensation program, and by 1920, there were 43 states that had enacted workers' compensation laws, and these laws were primarily around financial compensation or financial support, but it shows the extent to which industrial injuries were an issue in the public domain at that time. The reason why the Soldiers' Rehabilitation Act was passed in 1918 was because during this discussion of 
vocational rehabilitation for the military and for civilians, congressional and political sentiment believed that the federal government had the responsibility to provide vocational rehabilitation services for soldiers, but there was considerable disagreement about the role of the federal government in providing vocational rehabilitation services to civilians. This was seen as a state role, and this concern lasted for some time. And the result of that is it was easy to pass politically to pass the 1918 Soldiers Rehabilitation Act, and, it, and there was continual discussion about passing a federal act involving civilians. Now, the interesting thing about all of that is that prior to 1918, most rehabilitation efforts had been provided by non-governmental charitable organizations. Some of these organizations started lobbying states to provide vocational rehabilitation services. In 1920, 12 states had already passed state vocational rehabilitation program laws. Six of those were actually in operation in 1920. Massachusetts would say they were the first one, but I understand that New Jersey challenges that claim. But we actually had operating state VR programs before the passage of the Smith-Fess Act in 1920. When the Smith-Fess Act was passed in 1920, it was also known as the National Civilian Vocational Rehabilitation Act, and it was a simple program responding to a relatively simple problem. That problem was serving people with physical disabilities primarily acquired through military service or through work. At that point, VR could only provide job training, guidance and counseling, prosthetics, and job placement. It was primarily seen as retraining people with a physical disability to do another job that did not involve the physical limitations that they had. We were only serving people with physical disabilities. We had a minimum age requirement of 16, primarily because that was the minimum age for work for a lot of uh, occupations. We incorporated a homemaker outcome as an allowable outcome because vocational rehabilitation was placed under the Department of Vocational Education, and homemaker was one of the training programs that were included in the Vocational Education Act. So because of its placement, we inherited an employment outcome of homemaker. The original grant in 1920 was time limited, and VR was not a permanent program. It had to be reauthorized continually. The future for the civilian VR program was still uncertain, in part because there was still considerable opposition to the federal government getting in to the state's business. Between 1920 and the passage of the Act and 1930, we see that in 1924, VR did get its first reauthorization, and due to a congressional error, it was for six years rather than for four, which was originally proposed. Still, that was passed over a continuing strong opposition to the federal role in civilian rehabilitation. In 1927, we saw the first professional organization founded the National Rehabilitation Association. We had a second reauthorization in 1930, and to summarize where we were at the end of that first decade, there were 140 VR workers nationally. They served 20,000 individuals with disabilities. They spent $1.7 million that year and rehabilitated 4,605 individuals into employment. A point that we also need to remember is that the 1920 Act was a voluntary act on the part of the states. It was not a requirement that states pick up the VR program. Nevertheless, by 1931, 46 states had picked up and developed vocational rehabilitation programs. The biggest events subsequent to 1930 came early. In 1932, President Roosevelt began passing acts related to his New Deal in order to deal with the Great Depression, with the high rates of unemployment that that caused, 
and with the high rates of folks going on to public assistance, uh, colloquially called the dole, for that period of time. VR was reauthorized for five years. It was touted as a cost-effective program, and VR was to work with individuals with disabilities who were on welfare to return to productive, tax-paying employment, and as a result of this external demand, funding increased. In 1935, VR was still not a permanent government program, and people still thought that this program would eventually be given totally over to the state. But in the New Deal legislation that established Social Security, the Social Security Act of 1935, language was inserted that made VR a permanent program. What this meant was now only Congress could discontinue the program where before, as a temporary program, only Congress could continue the program through an affirmative act to reauthorize the act. One of the recognitions of this permanency again showed up in increased funding for VR. Also in the 30s, individuals with blindness were eligible to be served by VR, but relatively few were. And so you saw the establishment of a couple of programs to help people with blindness acquire employment in ways that involved, first of all, the Randolph Shepard Act in 1936, which established a vending stand preference in federal buildings for individuals who were blind. And in 1938, the Wagner O'Day Act required the federal government to purchase goods from nonprofits that were employing 75% of their workforce as individuals with blindness. A major change to VR came in 1943 with the passage of the Barden La Follette Act. What was going on in the environment at that time was that professional organizations had started to become effective lobbyists. The lobbying was moving from charitable organizations to professional organizations, including NRA and the State Vocational Rehabilitation Council, which was formed in 1940, could be considered Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation predecessors. We also had World War II underway, which had highlighted the need for a workforce to replace those that were in the military, and it started to highlight some issues with the original smith Fest legislation. It also changed the name of the VR legislation to the Vocational Rehabilitation Act. With the 1943 amendments, complexity increases and the program undergoes substantial change. Services expanded, but these services were based on economic need and the services not being available elsewhere, which was an early form of comparable benefits. And these new services included physical restoration, hospitalization, transportation, occupational tools and licenses, prosthetic prosthetics for employment, maintenance during training, and books and training materials. But it also went further than that. When you really got to the bottom of all the changes, it actually authorized state VR agencies to provide any service necessary to render an individual fit to engage in a remunerative occupation. I want you to remember this. I want to come back to this in, in a couple of slides. What was really the biggest change was that it removed the term physical from the definition of disabled persons. It marked the beginning of what becomes a long-term shift to serving people with most significant disabilities, and it opens up the ability of the state VR program to serve people with uh, intellectual and mental health-related conditions. To show, in a way, how there was a need to serve people with the most significant disabilities, the law created an option for states to create separate vocational rehabilitation agencies to serve individuals with blindness. Now, this act passed in 1933, but by 1944, one year later, we had 32 agencies for the blind created by the states. The next major set of amendments occurred in 1954. And what was going on in the world between 1943 and 1954 was that we were in the Korean police action, which again created manpower needs. VR was also more publicly visible than it had ever been. 
and there were many interesting public relations activities about VR, but two of them I found particularly interesting. There was a radio show, a 15-minute radio show, called David Selton Counselor that presented an individual with a disability going through the rehab process and be becoming a successful outcome. This 15-minute radio show went on for several years and was carried by 400 radio stations across the country. In the early 50s, there was actually a TV program called Comeback that was developed as a full TV show instead of a short public service announcement that also showed the results of providing services to individuals with disabilities that led to employment. The late 1940s was also the beginning of university training and rehabilitation counseling. A few universities had started to develop some curriculum around that issue, essentially on their own. The relationship with Social Security changed in this period of time, and VR agencies were allowed to set up units and staff to provide Social Security disability determinations. And while not every state agency currently has those, we still have the majority of initial Social Security disability determinations being done by staff that work for that unit in a state VR agency. In addition, in 1956, the SSA policy started referring all applicants to VR. State employment offices, another one of our partners from the Department of Labor, were required to have at least one person in each of their employment offices to be a liaison to the state VR program and to work with people with disabilities. Another big thing that occurred in the early 50s is Mary Switzer comes to VR in 1951. She was instrumental in especially the legislative uh, negotiations and growth of VR until her retirement in 1970. And one of the important things that she did was to define vocational rehabilitation by saying, in relation to the handicapped person who can be prepared for gainful employment, it means restoration to the fullest physical, mental, social, vocational, and economic usefulness for which she is capable. So what you have at this point is, is a belief that VR can help a person reach their highest potential and can provide basically any service, remember two slides ago, any service it takes to achieve that employment outcome. In some ways, I can't help but feel that this was sort of the highest philosophical peak of VR. You could do anything it took to help a person get any job that they were capable of doing. All of these environmental events led to a significant number of changes in VR in the 1954 amendments. The first four bullets on this slide really have to do with increasing professionalism, providing training for staff who were working in state VR agencies and working with people with disabilities, and resulted in authorities to do research and development to provide long-term training programs to train staff in universities, to provide short-term training on special topics, and to provide money to state vocational rehabilitation agencies for them to provide programs of in-service training to keep their current employees up to speed with the most modern development. Physically, there were authorities to build and operate comprehensive rehabilitation centers and to expand community rehabilitation programs. Some concepts that kind of began to emerge from these amendments included early versions of comparable benefits where we were encouraged to cooperate and use state and local agencies, an early concept of order of selection and statewideness, meaning that VR service, all VR services had to be available in all of the political subdivisions of the state. President Eisenhower made some important comments, I thought, upon signing the 1954 amendments into law. He said, this law is especially noteworthy in two respects. In the first place, it reemphasizes to all the world the great value we in America place upon the worth and dignity of each individual human being. 
ten second, it is a humanitarian investment of great importance, yet it saves substantial sums of money for the federal and state governments. For a long time, this humanitarian purpose for VR coexisted with the belief and the need to show that you were cost effective. But I think in this day and age, it's refreshing to see the first bullet where we're really talking about the fact that this program is an example of placing value on the worth and dignity of each individual. The 1960s were an interesting time in the United States across the board. We had great society programs going on that pulled, as we'll see, VR into working with the disadvantaged. Several programs were attached to VR at this time. The Work Incentive Program was actually funding to work with people on welfare, primarily aid to families with dependent children, to apply the VR process to getting those folks to complete a course of VR and achieve an employment outcome. There was discussion about behavior disorders as a category primarily related to attempts to try to work with prisoners to rehabilitate them into society as they came back out. And part of the Great Society uh, programs that passed with Medicare. And the whole civil rights discussion changed the role of advocacy in VR. We moved early on from charitable organizations to professional organizations. And during the 60s, individuals with disabilities picked up on the advocacy efforts and style of the civil rights movement to become advocates for themselves, and their advocacy had an impact, as we'll see in a couple of slides. Another big thing, in the 60s, there was considerable discussion about deinstitutionalization and closing state schools for the mentally retarded, mental institutions, and giving folks there an opportunity to come back and live in the community. One result of that at the end of the decade of the 60s was the passage of the Developmental Disabilities Act, which brought a lot of folks out of those settings into the communities and eventually to VR. To help address deinstitutionalization, there was increased federal funding for community mental health centers and for what was called mental retardation centers, although I'm not really sure what those looked like. It was not as obvious to me, anyway, as seeing the development of community mental health centers to provide treatment to support folks with mental illness in the community. Another interesting thing from the 60s is the beginning of Schedule A federal employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Now, if you remember from the 1954 amendments, we created research and development, training, and related opportunities, and they had taken off by the 60s. For example, training programs that, that RSA funded had uh, increased to 526 long-term university-based training programs for a variety of different specialties, not just rehabilitation counseling. And there were 135 short-term training grants in existence during this period. In the Department of Labor, they created the Manpower Development and Training Act and Job Corps. And these programs hooked up to some extent with the VR program, and we were serving folks in those programs who also were eligible for VR. Social Security gets more creative, and for a period of time, could use up to, I believe, 1% of the trust fund to give money to upfront to state VR agencies to pay, to make a special effort and pay attention to Social Security recipients and try to get them back to work. You saw earlier in several places that VR funding kept going up when external things happened. From the 1954 amendments where VR was spending about $35 million a year, funding quadrupled to $154 million at the time they were considering the 1965 amendments. So as a result of the Great Society efforts, there were amendments to the VR Act in 1965, 1967, and 1968. In 1965, the match rate was raised to 75% federal dollars and 25% state contribution. The states were required to maintain their financial efforts so they couldn't just back off and let the federal money 
replace state money. They were required to develop plans to serve all in the state who need VR, kind of a prelude to order of selection. They added new kinds of professional staff to provide services, in part as a result of the training programs that we had set up. So we were looking at rehabilitation psychology and vocational evaluation and a number of new professional positions coming into the state agency. And finally, there were some interesting starts to a more coordinated way of working with our partners. There was a fair amount of co-location of staff with other federal agency programs operating in the state. And there was a lot of assigning individual VR staff to serve as liaisons to various other federal programs. The 1965 amendments also removed age limits. They created the opportunity for six-month and 18-month extended evaluations rather than just determining someone ineligible who had a period of time to provide services to determine if services and employment outcomes were possible. Probably the hallmark great society um, impact was adding into the VR program the concept of behavior disorders. This was actually a term for folks who were disadvantaged but did not have traditional disabilities. And as I remember it in the state that I worked, we determined eligibility for VR based on behavior disorders with a checklist of things that had to do with chronic unemployment, uh, history of incarceration, uh, a number of things that basically were not traditional disabilities but were behaviors or barriers to employment that needed to be overcome. Third-party cooperative arrangements started with schools, institutions serving mental retardation, as the term was at that, po at that point, uh, mental health institutions, and uh, schools especially. And there were formally established VR programs for prisoners with staff actually stationed in the prison and participating in pre-release planning. In 1967, residency requirements were removed. And in 1968, there were funding for vocational evaluation and work adjustment programs that included people who were non-disabled. Again, folks primarily who were disadvantaged or on welfare or associated with other federal programs. The match rate was raised to 80% federal funds. And VR services were broadened to include follow-up services to families, services to groups, and establishment and construction of rehabilitation facilities. And finally, projects with industries created with, and it allowed state VR agencies to form private industry partnerships to develop programs to place folks, employers who had manpower needs. These, some of these were very productive. When we come to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, one of the things that had been going on was that the development of the 1973 Act was significantly impacted by the advocacy of individuals with disabilities and studies and testimony from others about how VR was not serving individuals with significant disabilities. In the Department of Labor, the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act replaced the Manpower Development and Training Act and started to return control of vocational training from the federal government level back to the state. We were also being asked to coordinate with the Education for Handicap and the Vocational Education Act. And the Wagner O'Day Act from the 30s was modified in 1973 to become the Javits-Wagner O'Day Act. And it expanded the requirements for the federal government to purchase from nonprofits serving the blind to purchase from nonprofits who were serving people with any disability. Again, um, I believe the 75% amount was retained, but now it could be any disability. We also saw a clear emphasis on independent living services as a result of these amendments. One of the things, if you remember, we're talking about behavior disorders, the great society pulling us into disadvantage. 
as a result of the testimony and the advocacy of individuals with disabilities. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973 began the shift away from working with the disadvantaged to working with individuals with significant disabilities. It strengthened individual participation of individuals with disabilities by development of requirements around the individualized written rehabilitation program and persons with disabilities participation in the development of those programs and by creating a client assistance program to provide assistance to individuals who wanted to make changes or to raise issues about their VR services with the state agencies. One feature of the act that I personally had never been aware of was that it allowed states to submit a, co a consolidated plan that included VR services and DD Act services. I'm not aware of that happening, but you can see that this is, again, uh, part of a series of changes that would encourage us to work with individuals with significant and most significant disabilities. Rehab engineering and assistive technology projects were funded as a result of these amendments. And, of course, Title V of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 created affirmative action and non-discrimination requirements that had broad impact. After the passage of amendments in 1973, there were a few environmental changes elsewhere that were important. One is that RSA was moved to the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services in the Department of Education. Primarily, this was done because hooking up VR with education would improve the transition of individuals from school to work. This was driven by Muriel Humphrey, who by this time was Senator Muriel Humphrey. She had taken the seat of her deceased husband, Hubert Humphrey, and she had a daughter with a disability and had an interest in ensuring that she would be able to transition from school to adult life and employment. In the Department of Labor, the Job Training and Partnership Act replaced CETA and the result of this that's important is that it further devolved control of job training programs to the state level. And I think in a, in a lot of ways the most important thing from this period of time was the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, in 1991. In 1986, new amendments were passed to the Rehabilitation Act that also supported this trend to working with the most significantly disabled. For example, supported employment was included in both formula and discretionary programs in RSA in allowing a place training model that would provide supports to individuals with the most significant disabilities as opposed to the train and place model that we started with back in 1920. It also included uh, the, the ability to provide transitional employment services which was a strategy primarily used to serve individuals with mental illness and to uh, provide a transition to employment from treatment and perhaps institutionalization. It added rehabilitation engineering as a VR service because people with the most significant physical disabilities often benefit from rehabilitation engineering services to create additional functionality. State VR agencies were required to create due process systems for appealing agency decisions, which fits into the development of the client assistance program and the, the desire to have individuals have more control over their rehabilitation services and programs. The strains will work occurred in this law we started to want to reduce the mass rate again, and the plan was to reduce from 80% to 75% over seven years. We never got there, and we got stuck in the middle of this reduction, and that's why the current 
federal share of the VR program is a kind of an unusual 78.7 percent. The 1992 amendments to the Rehabilitation Act actually could be seen as one of the primary vehicles to implement the provisions of the ADA. Among other things, it allowed us to presume that individuals, even with severe disabilities, could benefit from VR services. That used to be one of the criteria for eligibility that were often used to deny services to folks with the most significant disabilities. Now, we are to presume that they are able to benefit and therefore we can serve them. Social Security Disability Insurance and SF Social Se Supplemental Security Income recipients were defined in the law to meet the definition of individual with a disability. They had gone through rigorous screening to be made eligible for those programs, and we were to assume that that document, documentation was sufficient to meet the standard of an individual with a disability. It created the State Rehabilitation Advisory Council to allow individuals with disabilities to participate in the direction of the state VR agency, and it enhanced the role of an individual with a disability to direct their own rehabilitation plan. It also required states develop definitions for the term most severely disabled, as it was known at that time, and it required eligibility decisions to be made within 60 days of referral. Again, a change to encourage services timely services, but also not to use eligibility determination as a way to not serve individuals with the most significant disabilities. Also as part of the 1992 amendments, RSA was directed to begin to develop program standards and indicators. We were required also to inform interagency agreements and policies and procedures for transition from school to VR, and the regulations further supported concepts of competitive employment, order of selection, and standards and indicators. In the 1998 amendments, the Workforce Investment Act attempted to coordinate workforce supports for individuals with disabilities. The VR 1998 amendments were included in the Workforce Investment Act as Title IV of that act, and that act included VR with Department of Labor programs and with vocational and adult education programs as part of that coordination attempt. Also, the State Rehabilitation Advisory Council became the State Rehabilitation Council. No longer advisory, but now the State Rehabilitation Council had a direct role in planning, policy, and oversight of the activities of the State VR Agency. The amendments increased the emphasis on transition from school to work and required VR to sign interagency agreements with institutions of higher education to ensure that there were no disputes, discrepancies, or slips between VR and the schools in serving students with disabilities attending colleges. A long time went on between 1998 and the next reauthorization for the VR Act in 2014. What we found ourselves with the passage of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act embedded in a number of systems. If you remember one of the early slides where we were talking about tightly coupled and loosely coupled, we are now embedded in the workforce system and required to make contributions to that system. We're embedded in the K-12 system to provide pre-employment transition services and regular transition services, and required to dedicate 15% of the VR state allotment for pre-employment transition services. We're now serving potentially eligible individuals rather than only folks that have been formally determined eligible. We're somewhat embedded with the DD, mental health, and Medicaid waiver programs in the states. By the extension of the supported employment service period and braiding with other 
programs to support programs in competitive employment. We're somewhat embedded now with Social Security through the provisions for state VR agencies to get reimbursement for successful employment of individuals on Social Security benefits. Also through collaboration with the Social Security Ticket to Work providers and their employment networks that serve uh, the Ticket to Work program. And VR, by virtue of what occurred in the 1998 amendments with WIA and the extension of some of those activities in the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, we are now much more at the table with and have access to the services of the workforce core partners. And given that it's now early 2020, and our last reauthorization was in 2014, it's time, again, for reauthorization. Just some odd thoughts about what's going on now that we might see in the next iteration of VR amendments. I see a lot of attempts to focus on improving the quality of employment that people achieve through using career pathways, apprenticeships, customized training, which is training developed to meet employer standards and in which employers generally hire the people who successfully complete those programs. State VR agencies are improving and reaching out through business engagement efforts to form greater partnerships with employers, and we are using labor market information both to improve our ability to know about and work with employers, but also to help individuals with disabilities develop better uh, vocational goals and to have a more informed choice with information about labor market, job markets, pay, and all of the other things we get from labor market information. We're also seeing efforts to provide competitive integrated employment options for all through improved supported employment services and by developing and implementing new customized employment service systems. The 2014 Act required a number of activities to reduce subminimum wage. And at this point in time, there's a study in progress that's not quite completed, but we are seeing that there has been a considerable reduction in the number of employers that are subminimum wage certificate holders and in the number of workers who are working at subminimum wage. The other thing that's happening at some times and places is that VR is infusing some of its principles and practices in partner agencies. For example, we're using in some places integrated resource teams to bring multiple agencies to the table to combine their efforts and come up with an integrated resource team plan to meet the needs of individuals in all of the areas that they may need assistance in and not just in the areas in which VR can provide services. We've also seen in our history and in current activities that there are precedents for getting partner programs to help fund VR activities. This has occurred through braiding. This has occurred through customized employment. Customized employment primarily tends to serve individuals with intellectual disabilities and individuals with severe mental illnesses. And so you have a number of agencies, DD agencies, mental health agencies, uh, your Medicaid waiver programs in the states, all serving the same folks. What's happened in a couple of recent instances is that when a state chose to develop a customized employment service system, all of these agencies came to the table and they came with money. They brought money to the table to fund pieces of this effort. So that's been a very interesting development. One of the things I was thinking about when I was thinking about the long road that VR has come and being a Tolkien Lord of the Rings fan and trying to think about the future road that VR is going to go on, this poem came to mind. This poem is taken from The Hobbit, the prequel to The Lord of the Rings, and it's modified slightly. But the poem goes like this. 
the road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. And we must follow, if we can, pursuing it with eager feet to where many paths and errands meet. And whither then, we cannot say. And I'm adding specifically, VR right now is in embedded in a place where many paths and errands meet. Many programs are now collaborating. We are having, I don't want to say mandatory relations, because that's not true in all cases, but we are having more relationships with more programs that are bringing more people and more resources to the table. So we don't know specifically what our future reauthorization is going to look like, but based on what we've seen in the last 100 years, what we can say is that VR will continue to incorporate new services and methods of operation that will improve employment outcomes for individuals with disabilities and rise to the challenges and demands of public policy and the ever-changing world in which we live. Happy 100 years, VR, and many more.